What can be said about the definition of the word enigma? Only that it is something difficult to describe, difficult to explain, and it has complicated significance, especially as we move to certain topics. Today I have the pleasure of welcoming somebody very influential in my life and whose story I did not know until recently, but has shown me a lot of things about being humble, being strong, and being a better person. We will be talking about health conditions, our families, and as well as things that we want to do to help our community. This is Juanita Sanchez. Okay, so welcome back again to Enigma, the Enigma episodes of the ESL sessions. Today, my guest is my other comadre. Uh, I've known her just as long as Denise, just as my comadre, just as long as my comadre Cassie. And, well, she's definitely been a, a an influential person in my life as well, a very close friend. So I'm going to go ahead and actually uh, let her introduce herself. So why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, comadre? All right, so hi, my name is Juanita. Um, <laughs> yeah, so my name is Juanita. Um, I, I'm from Fernley. Um, I have two kids, two daughters, uh, Marisol and Jimena. Um, I'm married for seven years. Um, I'm currently studying for a secondary education with an ESL endorsement. Um, so yeah, pretty much that it. That's it. Uh, my friend can ask me questions as we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's the point. That's the point of the interview. Yeah. But yeah, like like I told you, like just before we started recording, and like like comadre, like la like comadre Cassie's told you, it's literally just an interview. We're just talking. We're just kind of like gathering some info and just kind of getting your your point of view. Like I said, it's it's mainly trying to to get a point of view and perspective, of like people in our community, like people that we grew up with, but also other things and, and effects of like us growing up as ESL kids as as always in a secondary language but also growing up in that like weird phase of where where we, where do we kind of stand in and and I think you are a a perfect subject because it's it's kind of interesting how a lot of what what you were talking about before we started recording and then right now how you mentioned the whole ESL aspect is is a little bit influential on how we grew up and then what classes we were in during during school. So, este, so let's let's start it off. Let's start off. How about tell me about like your early life? So where where were you born? Like tell me about, about you as a kid, you as a teenager, and then where you are now as an adult. So start off with okay. with being a child. Um, cool. So I. Okay, yeah. So I was born in Los Angeles. Um, my parents moved from Mexico um, into Los Angeles. Um, we were there for a few years. My dad worked in um, carpet. Um, he did carpet making, and um, I was the first. I'm the oldest. I was the first child. We were there not very long. <laughs> then we moved to Washington, where my dad began to work in the apple fields. Um, we were there for a few years. Like I said, my dad was a picker. My mom would be a babysitter. Um, then my sister was born, and we were there for about three years, I want to say, if I'm not mistaken. Um, my dad there, he worked for a while. My mom, like I said, was just staying at home. Um, my dad worked for a while, and then he got into the business of restaurants. Um, my dad applied to a restaurant <laughs> to be hired as a cook. Um, the cook did not, the guy, the owner of the restaurant did not hire him because um, he did not need anyone at the time. My dad asked if he could work for free. And um, the owner was really confused. He was like, why work for free? You know, why waste your time here with us? You're juggling your future. And he was like, no, I just want to learn. Hmm. Um, so my dad learned the restaurant business there. Um, then he gathered all of us up and we moved from Washington to Nevada, to Fallon, Nevada. Um, I was there for 12 years. But um, right when we arrived, my dad started a, a business with one of my uncles. Um, he opened a restaurant risking everything, like I said. Um, we moved from what we had a, a you know, a, a decent home in Washington to a one bedroom apartment in Fallon. So he risked everything. Um, my mom and dad arrived and they had nothing, literally nothing to sit on, nothing there. 
um, I was there um, until sixth grade. And, you know, the restaurant was going well. Um, we did have, you know, it was the first Mexican restaurant in town. So we did have um, some barriers to jump through, at least they did. Um, and, you know, it was hard growing up just being like new. Um, I was fluent in only Spanish. Um, I learned English while in grade school. And um, it was just hard to communicate with my parents. I would go home and, um, you know, they would help me with the homework the best they could. And I think that's where my educational field comes in um, because I, I always felt, you know, I, now that I'm grown up, I can feel what they went through, like doing their best to help me with all my assignments. So um, even though like this, you know, this state, um, I feel like we, we come into an English only speaking place, you know, and um, it was just really hard for them to communicate with me. Well, I was only speaking English and Spanish at school. I could only speak Spanish in home, at home. So that was one of my things. Um, so I was in Fallon for about until I was 12. Then my dad opened, my parents opened another business in Fernley. Um, and I grew up here as well. <laughs> and that's where I met you guys, you and Cassie. And, um, you know, here it was a little harder, I want to say. I was a new kid. I was pointed out a lot. Um, I had no friends. <laughs> and um, I was very quiet. I was very quiet, and then um, I think, you know, I I was really hard at making friends. I wasn't very social, so um, when I was 15, um, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, so that took a lot about my teen, that, like, you know, it swallowed a lot about my teenage years, so um, I was going through ovarian cancer for three years, and um, that kind of swallowed that whole age <laughs> gap right there, mm -hmm. so... Um, yeah, like I was just home most of the time. And then when I went back to school again, I was pointed at, you know, for being sick. So um, then I met like, you know, all my I kind of found a group that I belong to, which was my biceps. <laughs> you know, I belong to that group and yeah. I could fully be the person <laughs> I was, you know, because I was really quiet. And then I went with this group and they brought the best out of me. Well, at least it, at least After we did. Surviving. Yeah, at least we, we were able to actually do that. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's a lot it to was unload. The best year I had. And, um, you know, and it brought out the best in me because, you know, I, I love to embrace my culture and I like to embrace who I am. And I feel like you guys brought it out in me because, like, I didn't know where I belonged, you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Um like I said, I don't know. I have so much to share about that year. Like it's crazy. <laughs> no, I mean we can we can yeah, even like go into it a little bit mind. more. Like we can go yeah, into it a little like, bit more. I so have just so much. <laughs> so all right. So let me bring it back just a bit. So it's like, it's interesting okay. that so like it's good. This it's gonna be like a little bit of a lag. So I would wait like a couple of seconds before as they're responding. But either way, no. I mean it's 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 still good. There's a lot in there that that you shared that like I knew about and that we had already talked about, all three of us. And then a couple things yeah. where it's just like where where I'm not gonna go into major details. Like I said, you you already kinda covered a good portion of it. And I think you're gonna go into it a little bit later too on on how how a lot of it affected a lot of our relationships with with people in in the small town of Fernley. But right. like it's it's a lot of the things that I had actually talked about in one of the actual previous episodes in the SL sessions talking about the actual price of glory, how you're mentioning that your dad, your dad actually being the the entrepreneur type where he was actually willing to work without pay just to be able to learn a trade a craft is something worth of a sacrifice where we're in and then after all that it still paid off and yet even after his payoff like you said being in a well-off situation he still decided you know what it's worth risking a second time to be able to to make a second establishment to to start a, a, a new business but also to reestablish yourself in a whole different location but to start from zero zero, like a lot of our families do, like I know our my parents have, like I know Cassie's parents have, like I now I know even more your parents have, is is crazy. It's an incredible thing. But it's like it's one of those things I definitely touched on that I still think a lot of people don't understand. They don't see that perspective from from this other side. Like no matter how right, how they see I it agree, at the moment. Like yeah, my parents or all of our parents, once they come over here, they risk every little thing. And I think we don't see it because, you know, they've already established ground here when we're growing up, you know. And even though we just see a glimpse of it, 
Um, I think we don't understand it until we're fully grown up. We have our own bills. We have our own families. And when that's when we see how much more they've struggled than we did, if I could say, you know. But um, I, I don't know. Like, every day, like, I'm surprised of how much they've accomplished. And um, every single day, I'm learning something new from them. Um, even though I'm almost 30 years old, you know, like I still learn from them. Yeah. And um, I, you know, the more I get into the business, the more I understand and the more I see how much they they went through without even going to college. So, you know, like they didn't need a business degree to be successful in an area that they wanted to be successful in. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's 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 really that that whole entire pursuit of. <laughs> of being dedicated that's that's all dedication right there and then that's that's the, that continual sacrifice the the actual willingness to to go through that that struggle that 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 continuous struggle just to be able to make a benefit for both not only themselves but also us as their kids which like you're saying we we don't realize it we don't realize to the extent but it's it's still a feat it's an incredible feat that just even to this day even to this day is just it's crazy. Like we still, I still ask myself that, but man, right. so, so, all right. So let's, let's go ahead and let's, let's, let's kind of keep it there and let's shift it a little bit though in, in position. Let's, let's talk about uh-huh. our, our, our early years then in that sense. So we're, so you've already moved around all over pretty much. So you went from LA to Washington yeah, <laughs> to, to, Fer, uh, to Fallon and then to Fernley and then, <laughs> that's where we we yeah. landed now tell me so and and then at this point you've already gone through through a whole roller coaster you've been through an up and down of situations like both financially emotionally culturally physically and medically it's that's that's a crazy thing and then how how old were you when when you were when you were diagnosed with cancer let's talk about that so i was diagnosed with ovarian cancer when i was 15 uh but they think i was um born with it or I had it when I was a child um it um they think it was part of like my pediatrician's neglect um kind of thing because they would always tell me you know I've always been a chubby girl let's be honest Mm -hmm. um and um they always said oh no it's because she's chubby it's because she doesn't exercise that's why she has a bigger figure but no I actually had a tumor that was about 20 pounds plus 10 pounds liquid in my, inside my body. Like, like they took out a bunch, like a, a total of 30, 40 pounds out of me. Yeah. So um, they think I, I was born with this tumor and just, you know, lived my life with it because um, I grew with it. I, I my, my body started functioning with it. So um, that's why I never felt sick or anything until it got to the point where, you know, I would exercise and I wanted to lose weight. You know, I was a teenager, you know, like I wanted to lose weight. I wanted to look good. And my stomach wouldn't go down. So then people started asking me if I was pregnant. (laughs) And that's when I was diagnosed until I was 15. But they really think I had it my whole life until I was 15. Wow. And now with, with this whole thing, like with, with, with it technically being, well, you considering it pediatrician's neglect. Now with asking questions and, and asking for follow-ups, nothing, they never did anything else about that. No, they just told me to go exercise. They told me to tell my mom. They told my mom to watch what I ate. I was eating too much. Um, they told me it was because it was um, just some fat that was there, stubborn fat. Wow, that's. So um, yeah. I think my whole childhood, I was faced with, you know, bullying and you know, like accusing me, like, "Oh, you're fat, you're fat, you're fat." When I really wasn't fat, I had a large mass inside mm-hmm. of me, you know. Yeah. And but those marks are there. And like those marks that, like, you know, kids are cruel in elementary school. Kids can be cruel, and you know, and my childhood was just that. Yeah, and then that's the thing is like, because we didn't meet until at least middle school, which we were like what twelve, thirteen, and even then, like. Like being honest, like like I said, we're being honest. Right. Like, I always thought you were just an, a a overly large girl. Like you were, but you were tall at the time too. That was the thing. You were tall, but you were also big. Yeah. But taking right. into consideration I've been that, tall. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. So it was always like the doctors putting me aside until I turned fifteen. Um, I remember I went to a party and 
this older lady, she asked me, she's like, oh, congrats on your baby. And I, I said, hey, I'm not pregnant. You know, like, okay. I ran outside of the out of the party crying, you know. And that's when my mom, you know, she figured there's something wrong. Yeah. Yeah, because I was going to the gym twice a day, three times a day. Because I really wanted to look thin for my quinceanera. So, uh, being the person that I am, you know, me, like, that got to my head. And, um, you know, I was really working on my weight loss. And, no, like, my face would, my face shrunk, my arm shrunk. And when they did the surgery on me, um, I lost like about 80 pounds. Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it was after that um, removal of the tumor, um, I had to go through a process to learn how to walk correctly. I had to learn how to breathe correctly because I was never breathing right. I was over always like heavy breathing. Um, my organs were all squished up. So I was never eating correctly either. I was eating portion like tiny bites you know and my stomach was about to explode yeah so wow practically yeah so these these are already just crazy yeah. endeavors this is you're, you're already going through a whole crazy scenario of like things that we would have never figured like i said it's like it's right and, and like you're saying i mean as kids i mean kids are cruel kids are definitely cruel yeah. like and and i'm not gonna chalk myself out of that because i know i was a crazy little bastard too when, when it came to certain things, but but even to that extent, it, it, it goes to show a lot of the, the things and situations that just kind of come up with school, which is a little bit interesting where being the fact that that's where we met, that's where a lot of our, our friendships flourished and a lot of our, I guess our, hmm, how can I word it, a bit of what we developed a little bit more, lo, lo más que desarrollamos right. came from school, so uh-huh. going through going through all of this where did you find refuge like in 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 all of this with 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 the whole obviously it's a whole medical situation it's a whole it's a whole emotional thing where did you find refuge where did you try to find comfort in things yeah um well i think after that after my surgery i went through chemotherapy um the doctor told me it was the best option because um of my you know, the tumor wants, like, I want to picture it. It was a big watermelon, you want to say? Mm. And in the middle, if they cut it in half, deep down in the middle, that's where all the cancer cells were. So um, this thing could have ruptured at any time, and it could have spread all over my body, right? So um, I they told me the best option was chemotherapy. And um, with chemo, you know, my family came together. <laughs> my mm-hmm. family came together because it was the worst time of my life. Um, my parents were there by my bedside every day. And um, my sisters were always there as well. They were little, but they were there. Mm-hmm. They were strong and they were there with me. Um, so, um, yeah, my parents, you know, it was in 2008. It was during the Great De- It was during the Depression we had. I don't know if you remember. Yep. I definitely but like I said, that. we were living off a restaurant and there was no customers because nobody had money. And I didn't have medical insurance and we were so much in debt. Like, I remember, you know, and, like, now I look back at it, and I was like, how did my parents do it? You know, like, hey, they had thousands of dollars in medical bills, but I was still getting chemo. Like, that was their number one concern. So, um, you know, like, my parents have been there, you know, in those moments, and those are my strong comfort zones. Like, being home with them. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, they could tell me everything was going to be okay, and it was going to be okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so, still, in family, you found a lot of that refuge. You found a lot of yes. that comfort still. Uh- yeah. Because at school, I felt like everyone pointed fingers at me. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I was the girl with the wig. You know, like, everyone pointed at me. Everyone said I was sick. You know, like, I didn't feel comfortable at school. I wanted to, you know, leave school. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like it was like, you know, like, como que me aventaron a los leones nomás. You know? Yeah, <laughs> like, no. That's how I felt. No, I believe it. <laughs> that was crazy. Yeah, so, yeah, so my comfort was definitely home <laughs> with my family. And... You know, it's it's interesting that you actually say it like that because that's actually kind of where I was going to lead the conversation to. Speaking about how... Uh-huh. <laughs> Sorry, my daughter. Yeah, you recognize her. <laughs> Can't always recognize that knock. Yeah. Just click, 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 click. <laughs> this, this is going to stay for the bloopers just for the fun of it. <laughs> right? <laughs> but okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. But okay, <laughs> but going going back into the conversation, going back to it. Entonces, 
like I said, it's 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 interesting that you kind of led into it about how how you found refuge at home, that you found comfort and you found a bit of solidarity, but that warm solidarity with your family, with your with your mom, with your dad, with your siblings, regardless of the situation. And yet at the one place where people kind of always feel they should be social, there should be always be they should be now. And, and I stress that really hard should feel accepted, should feel like there's some sort of aching and support there isn't and it's it's interesting mm-hmm. because that's kind of the subject where i'm actually going through is where we're going to mm-hmm. touch a little bit on how currently the education system is especially since you as well as my our comadre denise have firsthand experience with this last i would say want to say this this previous generation at least within the last five years five years of of children growing up and and what you've seen right so yeah so let's let's touch on that. So you okay. firsthand, you firsthand already experienced the 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 social effects of bullying to to a great extent. Mm-hmm. Now, w- let me ask this: When did you start your I guess your your uh, your teacher's assistants the 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 time that you were a, a student teacher? Like when did you start going to school for for teaching? Okay, so um, backstory. Um, I went to school for business for a while, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, you know, I was there. I, I, I liked it, but I didn't seem like I didn't want to work every day in my life. I wanted to enjoy what I was doing. You know, I'm going to school to enjoy it, to grow on it, to be something that I do with a passion. You know, and mm-hmm. I business wasn't there for me. Like I was almost done, and I realized, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. And um, I took a break. Um, and I got, that's when I was pregnant with Marisol and I volunteered as an ESL. Um, so English has a second language, but like for adults. So I was teaching, um, with Cassandra, um, you know, just people that wanted to learn English at night for yeah. adults. And, um, we volunteered and I learned that I loved it. You know, like I learned that I was being helpful and I loved that area, you know, like that people could actually, you know, I could inspire someone to do something, you know? And um, once I had Marisol, I was like, you know, like, I really like the education field. I'm going to give it a shot. But then right after I got pregnant with Jimena. So um, I think it came one in one that, I, you know, I wanted to get a career where I would be available for my daughters as well. So since they're so close in age. And um, I think I've always had an area for that. Like, I've always had a caring personality. I've always wanted to, you know, and I enjoy spending time with kids. And it's just something that I looked into and I learned to really love. So, um, and, you know, like, like I mentioned before, growing up, my parents didn't have time to help me. Well, they had time, but they didn't have the ability to help me with the homework. So um, all of my assignments were always in English. I don't know about yours, but all of my assignments are always in English. Yeah, pretty much. And my parents did their best, their best to help me out, but they couldn't. And like, nobody ever said, hey, do you need like assistance or anything in Spanish? No, no one offered that. Um, they were never aware of like the resources. They were never aware of like FAFSA and stuff like that. So um, that's kind of where I'm at now. <laughs> um, I want to help ki- help kids that come to this country and they don't speak, you know, English. They don't speak another language or whatnot, and um, and help them understand that I'm here to help them. That they're not lost. <laughs> um, that I want to communicate with them. That I want to connect with them and not just get you know information thrown at them. Yeah. No, that's that's true too. So that's I mean, kind of where I picked up right now, you know, like because because you know sometimes you're just put in the ESL program because hey, English isn't your first language, and that's annoying. Because <laughs> like you know, like you can have kids that are ESL and are gifted at the same time, but no one finds them, no one recruits them because they're automatically put at the bottom of the list. Yeah, and it's a really stereotypical type of situation too, where like you 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 see, and here's the funny thing about that is that. There, there's actually been studies proven that with, with the whole factor about how every single kid that actually speaks a second language, for the most part, has mm-hmm. a, a overly developed sense of, of, so, of problem solving skills because they're consistently having to both translate and retranslate both from native language to English back to native language and then see a different perspective. And then, but here's, here's another funny thing about that too, and I'm pretty sure you've heard about this one, is the fact that mm-hmm. As a person who speaks 
two languages, you have two different types of personalities. You are two completely different yeah. people. So it's and then like yeah. I don't know if that makes us psychos or if that makes us schizophrenics or whatever. Because I hear voices in my head all the time, and they usually start speaking a different language, and I'm like, oh wait, hold on, I can yeah, actually, I, I exactly, I can understand it. Like ah, it's a Spanish. <laughs> So. Right. And no, yeah. And I just hate that idea that like, so one day I was subbing for an ESL class and um, they caught me speaking just Spanish to a student that had just gone here from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And they were like, hey, you can't speak Spanish to him. And I was like, why? They're like, because we want him to learn English. But I was like, you understand how confused this kid is that he's getting thrown into the school. It's his first day back in school um, in a new country, in a new place. Um, he's getting this material thrown at him, not knowing the language. It's five times harder for him to learn it mm -hmm. than a standard kid. And, you know, they don't see that. Like, I know he has to learn English, but, you know, I feel like we should throw some Spanish in there just to ease him out, like ease him in and into it. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No. And that's kind of like what makes my passion grow even more. And it's true, though. It's it's really true because like even even in, and I'm pretty sure we've seen it you especially more now in the in the, the the time that you spent as a substitute teacher is like you saw it most of the kids that actually came or even just missed a year and went to mexico to to continue their studies mm -hmm. over there they still they they still get held back hell we know three or four people that yeah. that had that were in that situation that were that we that i can say that we grew up with that we're here in uh, we're with we're here with us in elementary school they left for a year and they come back and then they're they're a year behind us just because the the educational system the the way the esl system is actually set up makes it pretty much that much harder for them to be able to catch up and i don't know if it's if, I, don't, I really don't understand that can do you right. know why is is what i'm asking too um, I think it's because they, they think that they won't understand the material, like the general material that's being taught in class. And I mean, like math is, you know, you can learn it not speaking English. Yeah. But I don't know why they're automatically thrown into the ESL program where they take away, you know, another class, a general ed class that they could be taking. Or they could be um, assessed for gifted and talented, which they never are because that stereotype. Yeah, that's true. And that, that really leads a lot of, to the stereotypes of it was just like, yeah, and even like standardized tests, like those aren't, you know, provided adequately for ESL students. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so, um, so, I, like I said, they're always put at the bottom of the list. Okay. So, speaking with that, <laughs> you, you, so us that have experienced standardized testing and then as well, and, and I'll even go as far as to say that we went through the No Child Left Behind initiative, which is still in mm -hmm. effect. And I can say from my personal experience that it is by far one of the most ridiculous things that the, the Board of Education even like did for both us as students as well as for teachers. Because right. um, I feel like kids test differently. Kids learn differently. Um, I can do perfectly fine in class and then get tested and my nerves go all over the place and I will fail that exam personally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, um, you know, or if I get overwhelmed with studying something, I will fail that exam. So that's how I work. Um, I, I know some kids have tests, you know, anxiety as well, and they can be faced with that. Um, I, I don't like the idea of that, but I mean, that's what we got to do. <laughs> but um, I, I honestly don't see, you know, sometimes it does frustrate educators. Yeah. Like, well, how, how, what a what have been some of the conversations that you have had with like other actual tenured teachers that have been there for, for a long time? Because you work both, you both worked at the, at the middle schools and at the high school, right? Yeah. So, um, my area more I'm looking at middle school. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, yeah, I've subbed at the, uh, the middle school and then right now I'm working for a program for college students. So they get tested a lot like the Occupacer. We get tested a lot on the Occupacer and, um, you know, a test shouldn't define where you're placed. No, it's true. Because you can do way better or, you know, it shouldn't be defined. Um, I think there should be other forms of defining students where they should be placed. And um, like I said, testing, test anxiety is, you know, it'll drive someone nuts. Like, it'll drive me crazy as well. So, you know, like the best thing I can do is like have them relax and stuff like that. But I know it'll be really hard. And I know a student shouldn't be based off just an exam. No, it's true. I mean, I know we definitely hit a lot on on about being educated and and continuing to to be able to to further further yourself on a scholarly level, 
but at a certain point it's it just doesn't seem like it just it just doesn't even seem logical the way that the the system works because like i said like you like we we both function very differently like you said like you mm-hmm. you already you already get anxiety you, you you hit a wall and as soon as you start going through through an examination cycle me on the other hand is like i'll i'll be a little bit nerve-wracked i'll be <laughs> sitting there and i was like man it's like this this whole situation just fucking sucks but i'll i'll somehow still yeah. be doing good like uh like even if i studied right. a bit portion like i'm able to at least breeze through the entire thing and get an average so it's really true and like and and, and, and this is looking at for at this is looking at two perspectives from two people that grew up like i said during the no child left behind perspective that whole entire sweeping mm-hmm. of of educational reform and and whole the the yes. the complete standardization of schooling which which placed a whole lot of emphasis on the the scoring of of how well you did on a cur- on a bell curve level placed on the state itself on the educational level of mm-hmm. the entire state not 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 your not your county which would in our situation would be good because i mean our county was small lion county was what we were like what maybe five thousand kids total right so it's yeah, like around there, I think. yeah and then that was that and then that was just in the high school level that was just in a high school level like now imagine encompassing them all together we still probably right. wouldn't even be able to break eight thousand <laughs> so anyway that's that was that's what living in a small community is right. too but that's that's crazy so uh, let me ask you yeah. this then if if you were to be able to change something else in in the way the educational systems works right now especially especially something in the esl field because like i feel we both share and i know we both share that that kind of passion to be able to to assist to be able to try to reconnect with with people of different cultures and origins that that have that have and probably will be dealing with the same situations of, of having to assimilate and this this is a whole completion on assimilation through the educational system and everything of assimilating to to the country through this educational system through the language and everything like what would you change about the ESL program in the school in the community I think I would find a different way to assess students that actually need the ESL program um, and not just have them thrown in there automatically, like, or put them two grades behind because they just speak Spanish or another language. Um, That's one thing I would do. Um, Another thing I would do is have provide them, like, some kind of, you know, not just give them, like, their original, um, not so, like, not just provide them with their um, first language, like resources with their first language, but provide them like a bilingual education mm-hmm. um, for a certain amount of time. And then, you know, like maybe they can grow and, you know, be proficient in the English language or not proficient, you know, at least understand some of it. Cause you know, students are like sponges and kids are like sponges and they'll grip onto a language fast. Oh yeah. Immediately. And um, you know, they don't need to be um, held back for two years. I don't think so at least. Okay. That's true. That's definitely true. Now, Let's move it a little bit more. Let's 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 move it to a different a different portion uh, of this whole thing. Now, we we like I said, we both grew up during the ESL things. Like, and I can say that a lot of what you're saying, I I felt it a lot of ways in a lot of ways subconsciously via one of our ESL teachers. And I don't know if you remember him. Actually, I'm pretty sure you either worked with him or you still remember him. But he actually. He was actually the first ESL teacher that I met, and it was just uh, Mr. March. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I so, met him. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of the things that I that I love that he did was was a, it was it was interesting because he he kind of knew he kind of knew and he understood the fact that I I was a kid that technically should have been in the ESL program, so he placed me in the ESL program, but. I can still kind of remember a little bit of the the first interview where he said we we sat down and he, we we started talking and he started asking me all these questions in both in English and Spanish to try to kind of try to mm-hmm. assess it. But he didn't he didn't place me in that whole situation. I was like, oh well, you kind of have an accent, but it doesn't seem like you're able to communicate both ways. Like no, he didn't do an assessment. He he did an overall observation of of me as a person, not as a student, not as a number, as a student. And even mm-hmm. though even though you could honestly tell, you could you could say 
from from personal just thinking and everything is like I was proficient hell I'm still proficient in English in some way in some level he still placed me in the ESL program and I think he did that too to be able to to kind of keep pushing the fact that understand this you are going to be able a little bit be a little bit more successful if you know your English but you're going to be a Mm -hmm. whole lot more successful if you continue to understand that you're not alone that year, there are also people in that same situation that will speak to you in Spanish, and not only will that not only will that help you, you'll learn from them as well, and they'll learn from you. So, it's yeah, it's crazy yeah, how he did that. Um, and I think with us, um, you know, we had our group in high school, and I I I praised it because we kept our roots going, we kept our culture going. All of us knew Spanish. And I feel like the generations coming in, a lot of them, if they don't keep their Spanish going, they lose them. Or mm-hmm. lo hablan mucho. Yeah. And Spanish, having two languages is such a beautiful thing. You know, like, it gives you further, you know, it gives you further job op- opportunities. Um, you grow your culture. You teach your future kids your culture, your traditions. And just knowing those two languages, y no hablarlo mucho, and not forget about it, is is amazing to me. <laughs> no, and it's true. And it's true. And, and, and even so, even so, not only kids coming from Mexico, but kids mm-hmm. born here too. Yeah. And even if they do speak it, si lo hablan mucho, sea lo que sea, de todos modos, como vienen diciendo, el intento es lo es el que cuenta. The the intent, the the, yeah. the act is what yeah. counts. So it's like you're you're still trying to pursue it in some way or some and somehow. That's the best way that you can do it. Yeah. And my my you know, and no one's perfect. My daughters right now, both of them, just speak English, and it drives me crazy. Yeah, right. You know? And I hate it. <laughs> I hate it because, you know, I want them to speak Spanish. I really do. And most people are like, you don't speak Spanish to them. I'm like, if you know me. Yeah. You know, I speak both languages to them. You know. Yeah. Like, you know, and um, no, but they only want to speak English. And it drives me crazy, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it'll grow on them hopefully soon. <laughs> no, it, it, it will. Yeah. It will. But the thing too is that you also, one thing, well, I'm not going to tell you how to parent one, first of all, because siendo mi comadre, I can't only, I can't, I can't do anything until after you're gone because that's, 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 that's what the rules of the church have said and everything, you know. Yes, I, <laughs> <laughs> right? The Bible said it. <laughs> well, the Bible said it. I can't, co- I can't, I can't co-parent until you're gone and that, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course you can. But you can't mal. Exactly, right? No, but like, no, like one thing that I learned yeah. was like, is like, uh-huh. is, is that it's, um, you have to surround yourself completely with, with the languages. Cause like, what was it like? I even, even like, even the, the, the three year, remember the three years that we, was it three? Yeah. We, we took the three years in German. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were in German and remember how yeah, crazy that was that that like learning a third language, which yeah. I mean, I don't know how much you retained for it. But me, I've I've gotten opportunities of actually to be able to use it, which is kind of weird because I never thought I'd actually use it. <laughs> and I haven't used it at all. And I forgot about it, you know, because yeah. I haven't used it at all with anyone. Like nobody around me speaks German, you know, so <laughs> exactly. Um, I haven't I haven't practiced it. So, you know, but I'm you know, I'm sure it'll, it was useful for you. And for me, like, it was, you know, I wish I could have grown on it, but, it, you know, I have no one to speak German in with. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and, and but yeah, that's the crazy yeah. thing about it. Like, we were so immersed in it, like, even just for those three years, but just enough that we were able to retain it, at least during that time frame, at least during that time. And then, like I said, yeah. and, then, and then now, I mean, like I said, with, with the few occasions that I've used it, just because of my job in the military and actually just being over to or being over to a couple places and like just future opportunities is just I I've, I've rarely used it other than just on on for fun but for the most part I've lost a lot of it and then that's that's one of those things that I think that parents that I can tell you as as a person that likes to study psychology and likes to observe is that with with the whole parenting it's about immersing them completely with it and one thing that I know doesn't help is like nowadays cartoons and everything is all English is universal Right. That's the thing. And even more right. so now with the whole streaming generation where everything where when we were growing up, it's like, screw it. You got to turn on Galavision, Televisa. You got to turn on Univision, Telemundo, mm-hmm. Telefutura. Like those those were the only channels in Spanish. And it was either that or or whatever other boring thing was on TV. But now it's like you literally just flip the switch and then everything's in English. Like the convenience is there. So it makes it a little difficult, but also yeah, that much more and easy. I think, and I think with my parents too, the con- 
the convenience with our parents as well. Because I don't know about you, but with me, like, I'd go to school and, you know, I'd speak English with my friends and my teachers and everything. But once I got home, like, I had to switch it off. Yeah. Because my parents were going to, you know, let me speak English at home with them. Oh, yeah. No, the only time you I know, ever like, used... I had to speak Spanish at the house. Yeah. Because I was the oldest, you know, and I had to communicate with them. Yeah. No, like, the only other time I actually ever used Spanish is, like, and in, in me and Denise, we talked about is, like, whenever we were translating things, it's, like, whenever you get the thing in the mail, it's, like, hey, ¿qué dice esto? ¿Cómo, cómo, cómo, cómo que? Es? Pues explícamelo. <laughs> and sitting there talking to freaking speaking legalese to them, and it's just, like, pues, es que, pues, como que... Estamos en problemas. ¿Cómo que estamos en problemas? Explícamelo bien, Jonathan. And I was like, man, I'm getting yelled at here. No, I remember like the doctors. I know the doctors for me yeah. would always yell at me. Because oh, I know yeah. how to translate things. And I'm like, what? Like, I was like, how do you say that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, not me being eight. Like, how would you know how to say that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. No, that's, yeah, but, uh -huh. that's funny as hell. My God. All right. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, that's that. Yeah. We've already touched on, on a lot with that. So let, let me, I guess, I guess, I don't know. That's, that, that's pretty decent enough. I mean, we definitely covered a good portion of like your life and especially a couple of the, the, the school influences, which was what a bit of what I wanted to touch on and especially like how things have actually been going through with, with what you're trying to pursue with, with trying to continue to be able to assist to be able to assist and, right. and continue helping our community in some way. And yeah, I don't know. Is, is there anything else you, you want to say anything else you want to touch on? Um, no, I think we did cover a good chunk of information about me. I mean, you know, um, I haven't finished yet, but I'm almost there with school. Um, so hopefully another day, you know, when I'm all done and actually practice and, you know, become a, a real teacher, <laughs> We can do this again. <laughs> no, hopefully. I mean, even in, I mean, if, if you're still not done though and yeah. everything, I mean, we can still always, I can always still come back. You can always still come back of and we course. can hit a whole different subject. Uh, one, ooh, actually. Yeah, my I, life is all kinds of chaotic. Yeah. I think <laughs> everybody's at a certain point, but you know, we don't, we don't, yeah. we don't admit it. We never admit it. <laughs> right. No, I'll admit it. <laughs> my life is all kinds of crazy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. But okay, comadre. Pues no. Pues if that's it, then I think we'll go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll leave it off for now. And este, like I said, right. until next time, we'll see We'll see if we can bring in the comadre Denise and actually have a, a different conversation. Because I think I think there's something that we're oh, yeah. all doing right now that I'm not going to talk about yet. But all I think this. All three of us together. Yeah. Yeah, that one's gonna be crazy. We're a good team. We're a good team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're a good team all together. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay, comadre, pues that's it. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. It was nice. Yeah, no, no problem. No, no. letting everything out. <laughs> no, hey, whenever you want to talk, you yeah. know what it is. And then if you, like I said, if you ever want to touch up on anything else, we can always have you come back. All right. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs>